Good morning, all, and uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to speak again on, on, uh, on this topic. Uh, my name is Jad Mawad. I'm a naval architect. I've been working with ballast water management since 2007, 2008. It's been many years ago. Uh, still working with ballast water management. Uh, I used to work at the class society at DNVGL, and now I'm six years ago we're working as a, as a consultant. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we are doing, what we are seeing in the market, and then I'm going to talk more about how we see the Ballast Water Management Convention being implemented nowadays. Um, very quickly, we are a consultancy company and doing uh, engineering and all sorts of other work, mainly related to ballast water management. Uh, we have offices, direct offices in, in Panama, headquartered in Norway. Uh, China and Korea are, of course, our biggest, uh, our biggest offices nowadays. And the reason why I put this, this slide up is it, it brings us back to where we see uh, the implementation of the Ballast Water Management Convention taking place, which is China. Uh, and in China, this is where we have our biggest office, and which is basically following where the action in ballast water management is taking place. Uh, very quickly, for those of you who are not aware of that, the Ballast Water Management Convention is, is aimed at uh, reducing the risk of transport of invasive species through ships' ballast water from across oceans and across ports. Uh, this is a problem that's become very significant with the increase of, of steel ships after in the 1940s, and, and now it's becoming a, a major problem for the sh ocean's ecosystems. Uh, the convention has entered into force many years ago, two, two years ago. And at that date, ships have started doing ballast water exchange in the middle of the oceans, meaning that you, you take the water from the port, you change it with more or less a bit cleaner uh, water in the middle of the ocean, and then you discharge it later on. So everybody talks about uh, treatment systems and so on, but, but we actually have done a lot already by doing exchange. The, the reduction of, of, of uh, invasion by uh, ships' ballast water is already well underway by the ships today, as they do ballast water exchange, and they've been doing it for two years. It's not enough. So now, as of 8th of September this year, which is a couple of months ago, uh, the convention requires ships to start meeting a, a discharge standard. The discharge standard is, is a numerical number of organisms per cubic meter of discharged ballast water and per milliliter, depending on the size of organisms. It doesn't say which organism or which fish or which uh, you, you need to discharge. It just says these are the numbers uh, based on their size. Uh, the vast majority of the ships will comply with the convention's uh, numerical standards by treating the ballast water with conventional treatment unit systems, uh, UV-based, ozone-based, electrolysis-based. Uh, you basically filter the water and you treat it with some UV or you filter it and you throw some chlorine on it in many different ways. Uh, there's a very complex and long type approval regime for ballast water management systems that need to be uh, complied with before it can be put on board ships. Uh, I've been involved in this process since the beginning. I've, I've written most of the regulations and I've contributed to most of them back then. Uh, there's, not, uh, there's always a good reason why the ballast water regulations became as complex as they are today. Uh, it's, a, it's a very long process involving hundreds of countries and experts and, and all sorts of people, and eventually it becomes complex and long and big, and we have, I think, countless of guidances and guidelines and, and so on, on on the Ballast Water Management Convention. Uh, what I want to focus my talk about today, I'm, I'm happy if people have questions about why the regulations became like that and, and what the regulations say. I'll, I'll be happy to answer those questions later at the panel. I, I just want to talk on what we see in China, basically, and, and worldwide, but mostly in China, taking place when we are now retrofitting all those ballast water management systems. Uh, these are numbers compiled by, by us at, at, uh, at the company where we are trying to uh, 
to see what the future is looking like for us and, and how, how we need to man our, ourselves. Um, engineering for retrofit is, is increasing quite a lot. What's increasing even more is the demand for being on board ships and doing supervision and commissioning of, of installations in China. Um, we anticipate that some 70% of all dry docks take place in China. And of those, uh, scrubbers and ballast water management systems are usually installed more or less at the same time. Uh, sometimes they do one before the other, but, but they're usually, uh, if there is a scrubber being installed, they just put in a ballast water system as well, and they do the engineering and so on at the same time. Uh, we, we see a curve of ships that have to comply with the new standard. That means they need to put a treatment system on board uh, and then within the next four or five years. Uh, the huge peak that we see coming up is in 2022. The reason being is that uh, the IMO has, has put some uh, has changed the dates all the time, when you need to comply and not, and ship owners have been changing their certifications regime based on that, and, and, and ships work like sheep. If somebody does it, everyone follows. Uh, especially Greek ship owners have been extremely fast in, in following the regulations of the IMO, and so we've seen that in 2017, the IMO decided that uh, you know, if you, if you have not done your IOPP certificate yet, you don't have to put a treatment system. And so all ship owners have done their IOPP certification more or less in August 2017. And then all the retrofit, more than 15,000 ships now have changed their dates up to more or less August 2022, which is five years from 2017. And we see that peak now in the curve. Uh, which is quite significant. It's putting a lot of strain on everything that, and, and that's going to happen, and uh, we simply don't have a solution for that problem because there's not even enough shipyards that can take 15,000 ships in one year. That's a huge number if you think about it. Uh, what we see is that uh, the Coast Guard, the American Coast Guard has their own ballast regulations. They, they do their own thing. They force ships to put equipment that are type approved by themselves, even though they're not flagged in the US. So you want to call the US port, you want to discharge in US ports, you have to use US approved equipment. Uh, the Coast Guard does not follow the same extension and implementation regime as the IMO. They have their own. And we see that taking effect on the uptake of ballast water treatment systems on ships. It shifts. If you go back, you see that the curve is more Straight with, with, with the Coast Guard, there are four or 5,000 ships that need to put the system a bit earlier. So that, that helps, if you want, spread the uptake of treatment systems on ships. Uh, what, what, is, what these numbers mean, in principle, is that uh, we will see a huge decline in the quality of the work that will be done on board ships. Why? Because people won't have enough time to do proper work. We see it already now. Uh, we get calls, we're docking in two months, can we put a treatment system on board? Yes, you can. Will it work? I don't think so. Uh, and so uh, it, it takes time to do a proper, proper engineering to choose a proper treatment system on board ships. We're, we're engineering now a huge uh, sewage max, and it's, they're putting a UV system, and they don't even have enough power to, to power it up, and so we need to put a new engine. And, put a new engine on a, on a huge tanker is not just like that, and the dry dock is in five weeks. These are things that are becoming to hap starting to happen already now without all these numbers coming up. So we see a huge challenge for the quality of the work that will be done. Uh, Chinese shipyards are, are, are very good in effectively uh, putting standard equipment, getting them to run, and getting the ship out. Uh, this is why, this is how they can maintain the prices, and, and this is why everyone goes to China to do the dry docks. Uh, the problem is that those shipyards, they don't see always the advantage of becoming uh, uh, experts in installing either scrubbers or ballast water treatment systems, which means that as ship owners, you, you, have, you probably have to follow it up more closely to make sure that it actually works and it's not, not just installed. Uh, 
we expect that uh, because of the problem in the capacity of the shipyards, probably ship owners will start putting systems earlier. At least that's the hope, but that's not happening. We still see it today. We have until 2022, we just wait until 2022. And then people are not putting systems before. Probably for, for uh, investment reasons, money, money-wise. If they don't have the money, they just don't do it. Uh, we see that uh, uh, engineering-wise, we will have to uh, step up. For those of you that are doing engineering, for the, you have to do a better job, basically making it more precise, putting systems that are more in more detailed way and actually can work, because you won't have time to do all these corrections in the shipyard. Because the more delays that happen in the shipyard because you've done the wrong engineering, the pipes don't, don't, don't add up, uh, the pumps don't work, it's undersized, etc. then the shipyard needs to take more time. And if everybody does that, then we, we will never finish. Uh, Testing for compliance is a requirement coming from the IMO that you need to actually sample the water and make sure that it actually meets the requirements before the ship leaves the yard. This will become mandatory for everyone in a year, year and a half. So uh, some, some flags have already started implementing it. Singapore is one of them. Uh, looking at that and looking about at those challenges on, on the implementation and the large number of ships we expect to come at the same time, uh, we don't expect units and, and equipment on board ships to work properly until at least 2029, which means that we probably need to do another run of renewal, renewal surveys before we actually make them, make them work. Uh, otherwise, we don't, we don't expect any uh, major changes in the implementation because of new regulations coming up in the US and other places. That's it for me. Thank you very much.